Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Science Connections, AI and Instruction, part two with Eric Cross. Um, I'm gonna give everybody just a little bit of time to get in here and get settled and then we'll go ahead and get started. But in the meantime, please feel free to drop in the chat um, your name, where you're from, what your role is in education. We'd love to hear from you all. Welcome educators. Look at all these folks showing up. Yeah, let us know where you are. I am in San Diego. It is 431 on the West Coast. I just finished teaching my middle school students. And, uh, and then I drove here so I could talk about AI with my colleagues. Um, Oklahoma, in the house. See ya. Michigan, Kentucky. Kentucky always putting out good educators. Um, Vegas, a lot of friends out there. Ohio, Nevada, more Michigan, Oklahoma. Jersey, that's where my dad is in East Orange, Jersey. Carol out in Illinois. Franklin. Emily in California, which part? Connecticut, more Nevada folks. Oregon, I'll be going there for spring break in the Pacific Northwest. Geo. Fourth grade, good to see you. Douglas out in AZ. Ontario, very cool. There we go. Now I'm getting a little international. Wait, is that Ontario? Is that Ontario, California? Don't trick me. Because you know, sometimes there's like, there's like Paris, there's like Paris, Texas. Texas, which, yeah. Which is not Paris, France. It's very different, very different. Canada, all right, thanks, Meg. We also have Panama though. So, you know, regardless, we've got reach. We do. Oh, hello from okay. India. Okay. Cool. India. Very cool. Okay. Well, it's been a couple of minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Again, thank you all so much for joining us for Science Connections, AI and Instruction, part two with Eric Cross. I am so excited because this first webinar in this series was so amazing that everyone wanted a part two because Eric is so great. So I just know that this webinar is also going to be absolutely incredible. Before I pass it over to Eric, though, I want to go over a couple of just housekeeping tips and tricks for everybody. If you would like to access closed captioning, please feel free to go ahead and click that closed captioning button in the bottom tray to go ahead and show subtitles for this Zoom webinar. Um, please feel free to participate and make comments in the chat at any point in time, but we will be using the Q&A function for this webinar. So if you do have a question for Eric, uh, please go ahead and drop it in the Q&A section and we can get to that um, at the end of the webinar. Uh, you will receive a certificate of attendance uh, with the webinar recording. Uh, so just keep an eye out uh, for that email that should be coming um, tomorrow or in the next day or two. And with that, I would love to introduce you to Eric Cross, the host of Science Connections and a current seventh grade science teacher. Um, at Albert Einstein Academics. He is so incredible. He's amazing. Um, he constantly works to build relationships with students and empower his colleagues. He's just the best person that I could think of to host this webinar. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to you, Eric. Ryan, can you can you come to my class and say that before I teach to my oh, students? Just... I would be so pleased to, Eric. <laughs> it's been a hot minute since I was in a classroom, so I would be more than happy to. Oh, you're the best. Um, all right, welcome everybody. Again, my name is Eric Cross, middle school science teacher. This is my 10th year in education. Uh, I teach 200 amazing middle school students out here in San Diego, California. And when I'm not teaching them, I teach the big ones at the University of San Diego. And when I'm not doing that, uh, one of my passions and hobbies is actually education technology. So this isn't something I talk about a lot on the podcast, but it is something that I've been doing for the last 10 years. So when AI became a big thing, um, it, it dovetailed perfectly into what I was doing. So without further ado, we'll get started. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. And if you all in the chat wouldn't mind, let me know. We good to go there? Can everyone see? Looks um, great. My screen. Thank you so much, Ryan. Okay. Um, first up. Uh, our agenda today, we're going to cover some major updates, some AI updates. So here's what I've done. I'm I'm going to leave this because we're all folks doing the same thing around the world. Um, I want this to be a PD that 
you were like, okay, I got something out of this. It was worth my time. So what I've done is I scoured AI news to find the most important updates and some neat tools that I use um, pretty much daily that you might be able to use in your classroom. And so these things are things that I've vetted. Um, so we're going to talk about some major updates, a few of those, some AI teaching tools. I'll show you how I use them. Um, I'll show you a cool tool that you can do with artificial intelligence. And then if you want to go further, I'll, I'll give you some resources for that. Everything I cover today will be shared. I put everything in a Google doc. So every, don't feel like you have to like write everything down and open a bunch of windows. You can, if you want, um, everything is in a doc. And then you can obviously contact me if you have questions on social media and all those good things. So without further ado. Uh, let's get started. And I want to make sure I'm sharing my sound too. Okay, good. I am. So first up is text to video. Now this is one that has been pretty big lately. If you haven't been following, um, we know about text to speech. Um, we know about text to image. If you've watched some of those deep fakes that have been going around, but text to video has made a pretty recent advancement. And so um, this is What's one. What's uh, we'll, hey. start, we'll start here. This is uh, Will Smith who had uh, his, his text to video, that is not actually him, that's an AI. And that's a year ago. But just a week ago, the most recent AI text to video came out. So what you're seeing on the right hand side is actually completely AI generated. None of that is, is real. And so you can just take a look in the last 365 days, the jump that we've had from Will Smith being simulated eating spaghetti to this beautiful image of, of a person walking. So this is a huge advancement. And again, this is the worst it's ever gonna get. Now, Will Smith had some, you know, he's been viral lately. And one of the reasons why is he actually took that AI video of him and uh, recreated it, which I thought was hilarious. And that's where the music came from. So I'll play a little bit of the music so you can see. The bottom video is real. It's actually him copying his AI video, but I thought he had a good sense of humor for that. I don't know what's going on with the eating the dreadlocks thing. That's a little, that's a little too far. Now here's another one. Uh, this is again, this is another text to video. So completely AI generated. And this raises some interesting questions, especially if you're working with students and you show them videos like this. What are the implications of just in the last year? I mean, we're seeing this dog, you can see uh, the screen showing up on his face and him interacting. I mean, unless you looked really closely, you would be hard pressed to think that this was completely AI generated, but but it was. Um, so definitely something that we've we've had some major advances with in the last uh, in the last year. So I'm really interested to see what happens in the next year. Now, one of the most popular AI tools is ChatGPT, and they just are slowly starting to roll out memory in chat GPT. So if you've ever used it before, maybe you can let me know in the chat if you've used chat GPT, if you've ever had any experiences with it. Um, if you haven't used it, one of the things it can do is you can conversate with it and it generates text for you. But one of the downsides has been, it doesn't remember conversations. So what they've been doing is rolling out a new memory feature. Well, it'll actually remember your conversation over a long period of time. So you can go back and forth with it for days, months, or even years, and it'll remember the entire history and the context of the conversation. That could be a huge game changer. So you don't have to keep restarting brand new chats. This is something that's slowly being rolled out to people who are free users, but also paid users as well. I don't have access to it yet. I wish I did because I can show it to you, but I was not one of the selected ones, um, but maybe you might be. So check your account. Uh, you'll go into your settings and see if you have managed memory on there. If you do, then you're going to be one of those people that can test it out. Maybe you can let us know how it is. All right, that brings us to our next update. So if you've been using AI for any period of time, you might have heard that it's kind of a race between all the big companies. Uh, one of the things that Google has done is they've actually rebranded Google Bard to Google Gemini. It's really the same thing, but if you're kind of playing in this AI space and you look up Google Gemini, that is another one of those uh, language learning models. It's one of those generative AI tools that you could use with ChatGPT. So if ChatGPT was Coke, uh, Google Gemini would be Pepsi. And one of the things that I encourage teachers to do is that if you put a prompt in one tool, 
put it in another one too and do like an A and B comparison. Many of us are science teachers. So kind of compare, like look at example one, example two. And if you want to use a third one, there's a company called Anthropic that has a tool called Claude.ai. Now you can look this up right now, or if you just wait for the resources, I'll drop them in the chat and you can play with it too. I actually will put the same prompt into all three tools and pick which one I like best. And sometimes I'll mix them together or pick and choose different things that I like. Let's get into our AI teaching tools. Before I do though, I, I kind of want to premise this. Um, if you're here, you are one of the front runners on the bleeding edge of education technology, and you might not feel like it, but you are. We are teaching the generation of AI natives. You might've heard of digital natives. These are kids who grew up with the internet, but the kids we're teaching now are artificial intelligence natives. I mean, if you're old enough to remember when the internet came out, like think about where it started when you were logging into AOL and someone was picking up the phone while you were trying to log in and you were yelling at them to get off the phone. I know I'm dating myself here, but educators, some of you have been in the game for a while. You can relate to this. You'd hear the beep on the phone. That's the phase that we're in right now with AI. And so the kids that are growing up with it are growing up in that AOL instant message time period where you would get all those free CDs. And so... It's important that we, we move forward with excitement, but also cautious skepticism. And so I wanna kind of front load a, a couple of things. One is we should follow the 80-20 rule. And right now what that means is that artificial intelligence can sometimes get us about 80% of the way there, but the 20%, which is the most important part, has to come from you. Um, it, it's, again, it's the wild, wild west. We're trying all these new tools, but they are not polished, even if they look pretty. So remember that you are the essential element in this. And even if you're a skeptic and you're watching this video and you're like, man, AI, Singularity, Skynet, they're gonna take over the world, it's only a matter of time. Black Mirror is becoming real. By the way, it's a show on Netflix. If you haven't watched it, check it out. That's fine, but I'm glad you're here because in order to critique it, we really have to understand how these tools work so that we can be critical accurately. And we wanna be cautiously skeptical and critical and asking hard questions because it's bringing up these philosophical questions that we may not have the answers to. So I wanna start there with 80-20. AI can get us 80% of the way there and some of the tools that we're gonna use, but remember 20% comes from you at least. And then next, trust your training over the technology. You went to school, became educators, and you were trained in these data-driven philosophies and practices. And at the end of the day, you're working with young human beings and what they need cannot be captured simply in a chat bot. At least not yet. I mean, Neuralink just released their patent or is releasing their patent about a brain that can move a mouse and click. So we'll see what will happen. But right now, it's still heavily dependent on us. So your teacher training is an essential part of all this while we're in this Wild West phase. So I just kind of wanted to front load with that as a disclaimer to say there are a lot of concerns and there is a lot of human thinking and emotion that needs to go into whatever the AI generates for us. That said, let's get into some cool tools. So first is ChatGPT custom GPT. So what this is, is now you could make your own AI bot that you can use. And so I made one for my science class and I'm gonna show you kind of how it works and um, yeah, walk you through how I use it with one of the assessments. So I'm gonna go ahead and change my screen and switch to my private account real quick um, because that's where I use my, my AI chat bot. Um, even though my school just today, shout out to Albert Einstein, just gave team pro accounts to chat GPT. So if you're at a school and they're really leading the way in AI, um, they can sign up the entire school for the paid version of chat GPT called chat GPT teams. And that was just rolled out. All right, so what you see here is my chat GPT screen. And I'm going to make it a little bit larger because I know it's kind of small on the screen. So let's go ahead and zoom in. And right over here on the left-hand side, I am using GPT-4, which is a paid subscription. It's 20 bucks a month. And on this, I have the ability to create and use existing AI bots. Now there's a lot of them. Uh, there's one that does um, text-to-speech. There's one that creates images. There's one that integrates into Canva. You can make a cartoon version of yourself because who doesn't want a cartoon version of themselves? 
There's so many different things you can do, but the cool thing is you can make your own. And that's what I did. So if you've used Amplify, you know that in the units, there are different types of activities that students can do and there are projects. And one of them in uh, the middle school curriculum is a food bar project. So what I did is I created something called educator assistant. And what my educator assistant is, is a TA for me that knows everything that I know and knows the entire curriculum. So this is what it looks like kind of under the hood to use a car analogy. When I use educator assistant and everybody has access to this on the, on the paid version, I click on configure and I could change the name. I gave it a description and what I told it is I said, you are gonna be an evaluator for my food bar project. In the metabolism unit in Amplify, students have to make food bars for people in a natural disaster and they have to write what's called an RFP or a request for proposal. Basically it's a long CER, but they're using data from their simulations to do it. That's a lot of reading. I teach 200 students. If I spent five minutes on every single article and they wrote just a hundred, that's 500 minutes. That's a long time. And that's what I've been doing year after year after year. And it takes me a lot longer than five minutes. So what I was wondering is what happens if I train the AI to do some of it for me? This is what I found out. So I gave it instructions and I told it, you're an educator assistant. Your primary role is to evaluate the design decision section. And then I gave it a rubric and I told it to grade it by the rubric. And I went into more detail about what it's looking for. Now I didn't stop there. I also had the ability to upload files. So what I did is I took the rubric from Amplify I took an exemplar that I manually graded. So a student that did a seven, eight on my rubric, which is at the top, I grade on a rubric for everything, one through eight, seven, eight would be the highest. Um, I took the dossier. I took all of the explanations about the, about the curriculum and I put it there. And then I uploaded it and I had it graded. And then let me show you an example of how it would work. So here in my preview window, I can tell it to assess, this student submission according to the instructions and files. And I already have a student work ready. So I'm going to go ahead and find that. Let's see. And I am going to hit send message. So now what I've done is I've taken the file itself, I've uploaded it, the student work, and it's assessing the student work against everything I've trained it to do. Now what it's doing is it's generating feedback. It's giving feedback on the criteria that I want it to give me feedback on. It's analyzing their application of evidence in their claim evidence reasoning. Now, it didn't generate it perfectly. So what I did is I went back and forth and modified it until the instructions were exactly what I wanted it to do. And once I took all of this, I copied it, I pasted it, and then I modified it to make some minor changes. Now, this is a lot of text. And my students would look at me and say, Mr. Cross, I'm not trying to read all that. So I re recognize, I go, you know what, that's a lot. So I said, rewrite this in student-friendly language. for a sixth grader, focus on the areas for growth to improve their score. And now I'm doing this live with you, which doesn't always work out the best, but uh, it's, it's working, so which is really good. My internet's solid and I have power in the house. So right now what it's doing is it's taking it and it reworded it into more student-friendly language. Yeah, I know. it's a total time saver, absolutely, which is the one commodity we can't get back is time. I can make more money, I can buy more things, but I can't get more time. And to be honest with you, some of the feedback that it writes is, was better than the feedback that I was writing manually when I was doing it at home late at night. And we know humans, as much as we like to think that we're objective and we're using rubrics, depending on the time of day and how much coffee I had and what period that I have a gap to grade in, my flexibility, if you're on the bubble, might be more positive or negative, depending on how I'm feeling that day, as much as I want to think I'm a completely objective person. But my educator assistant doesn't work like that. It's completely objective. 
And it doesn't matter what time of the day that I'm talking to it, it will give me similar feedback as long as I give it good input. So this is something that I've been using. Um, it's been a lot of fun and really interesting and it was a huge time saver. It cut my grading time down about 80%. So what I've been doing is taking the feedback, modifying it, and sometimes it makes mistakes. And so again, that's the 20% that's on me and giving it to students. And you know what they love? I could actually do this in class and give them instant feedback. And if we go to Ed Research, we know that it's better to give students frequent feedback throughout the process, as opposed to having them do the entire project, give them feedback on the end, and then expect them to turn it back in. And I don't know about your kids, and I love my students, but if I await the entire project and give them feedback at the very end, even if they're allowed to redo it, I get very few that do, even if they get low scores. And that's more of a human thing than it is a statement about our students. It's more of just a people thing. When we work on something and we make minor course corrections, we find that we're much more receptive to feedback and making those small changes along the way versus making a massive amount of changes at the very end when you've invested so much into it. So um, Ashley, for this, this is one that I created. Um, how long did it take me to create, Danielle? It took me, to be honest, it took me about 20 minutes to do. Um, when you go and you create your own, you can click on explore GPTs and then you have the option here to go to create. So I'm gonna click on create and they actually have a bot that will help you create. So what I'm gonna do is say, um, create a teacher assistant to help evaluate labs in a science classroom for middle school students. So now what it's doing is it's configuring the GPT for me. So Ashley, this is, uh, if you have the paid version of chat GPT, this is on, on that and it's $20 a month for that one. Um, and this is one that I've been using. So again, I'm not, by the way, I don't get paid by any of these companies I'm sharing with you. Uh, like chat GPT, all like, they don't send me anything. Um, but for me, 20 bucks that gave me my time back. Like that was a bang for the buck. And I'm all about frugality. That was one that like created value for me um, to do that. So yeah, Shell, you have to have the, the paid version to build your own bot like this. Um, so it asked me, would you like the name Matt Lab Mentor? Sounds good. Let's do it. So we're going to do Lab Mentor and it's going to create this, this bot for me. And it's going to create its own profile picture too, because it's kind of vain like that. So it wants to have its own little, you know, profile pic. Um, uh, Brittany, it's a month. Now with schools, my school just bought the premium version for everybody there. You could do something called teams. Now it's like the school account and it's 20 bucks a month. Um, no, the, the students don't actually see the response. I copy and paste it or I attach it as a comment in their Google doc, Danielle. So yeah, I'll copy it and then I'll put it in canvas. That's our learning management system, or I'll put it on a Google doc, like as a, you know, feedback for comments on, on Google docs. So there's our picture. Yeah, I like it. And now we're ready to go. And my next step from here would be to configure it. So I've given it instructions. Now what I would do is upload files. I would upload labs, like exemplar labs, and tell it to what to look for, how to read graphs, um, what a good, uh, what a good uh, lab report might look like, how to check for evidence certain things I wanted to focus on before I actually uploaded things. So just like you're talking to your TA, um, I would talk to it the same way and then upload files that are quality files for it to compare it to. Is it open source? So it's okay for seventh and eighth grade. Um, if it's for, I'm using it as a teacher for seventh grade right now, but you can use it all the way up through, through college if you like, just depending on how you design the bot. So I'm going to pause there. It looks like I answered all those questions in the chat. That's the first tool that I wanted to share. Now, the next one is, um, the next ones I'm going to share with you are completely free, or I should say freemium. And as you know, if you've been working in education, this tech space for any length of time, you know what they do, right? They always roll out the tool first, and then it's like free for everyone. You're like, this is amazing. And then six months later, uh, they're like, okay, if you want to you know, continue, sign up for this, you know, subscription service. And that's, that's just kind of how they, 
how it, how it goes. And everybody's trying to make money. So I'm not mad at anybody for that, but I'm also a teacher with a budget. So the next thing that we're going to, I'm going to show is uh, a, a tool called Diffit. And Diffit is one that I've been liking a lot. And if you're a teacher, if you sign up, I believe you get 60 day free uh, premium for free. So you get all the bonus tools for free for 60 days. Um, and what it does, once you go to Diffit, is it will differentiate text for you, but it does so much more. Uh, so I'm gonna start off with an article that I took from uh, the Amplify curriculum. So I'm gonna choose a file. Now I can go to a website, I can find something on CNN Student News, uh, Science News for Kids. I could copy a text that I wrote and paste it here, but I already have an article that's been made. So I'm just gonna click any text and I'm gonna go down to choose file. Now I have my text here in Amplify and it is the human microbiome, it's my first unit. I'm gonna click open and I'm gonna change the reading level. So my students read, and this is true, uh, my students read between a lexile range of first grade to 12th grade in seventh grade. And some of you out there might be able to relate. You want to support literacy for everyone, but your differentiation range is massively wide. And you could probably spend your entire prep period rewriting articles so that they're accessible for all of your kids because you want them to be able to access the reading. And so how do we do that? Well, here's one of the ways that I found. I took this article and I clicked third grade. Now I also could change the language. So if I wanted to select a different language, it will translate it and I can click generate resources. So while this is going, it is gonna create not only a differentiated text, but it's also gonna create resources for me that I can use. Now as a science teacher, I learned some of the literacy tools after I learned the science tools. Science came much more intrinsic to me, but teaching, reading, writing, speaking, listening, that was something that I feel like I had to add on to my skill set. So now what you see is the human microbiome article. And here's the passage. And it looks like I'm not logged in. So let me go ahead and log in with my account. There we go. Now here I can select which picture I want to have as the intro picture. I'm gonna choose this one. And then right down here is the adapted reading passage for third grade. Now, if you've seen this before, you know it's a massive amount of text compared to what the third grade text is. And then just below that, it creates a summary with the main points of what the article is about. It pulled out the key vocabulary words and defined them. It also created multiple choice questions. Now, all of these I can edit. So if I don't like these answers or there's a mistake or a hallucination, which is when AI kind of just makes up something, I can go through and click edit, or I can just copy these directly somewhere. It also came up with short answer questions and open-ended prompts. So this it did in what, seven seconds from an article that I just uploaded. So instantly I already have a way for students to be able to interact with the text, but it gets even better. If you click on get student activities, it gives you several different graphic organizers that you can create PDFs or import to Google Slides. So we have the Frere model, a CER workbook, um, bubble maps with images. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and change this to my grade level, which is seventh. And I'm gonna choose a subject science. So what it's doing is filtering out things that aren't really relevant for me. And then for format, I can do printable or digital. And I want to do, let's do the, Compare and contrast. I want something that's going to pull in information. We have the KWL workbook. So let's go ahead and click on that. And we're going to open this with Google Slides. Body, this would be a tool that I would I would use for kindergarten and, and English language learners. That's that um, and that is one of the populations that I serve is a large amount of English language learners. So literacy and making science accessible for my students is job one oftentimes for me. So what it's doing right now is it's generating some Google Slides that I can create a PDF with, or I can push out on Google Classroom, Schoology. 
um, you know, whatever you learn in management software is, it's going to be already made for you. So let's go ahead and open in slides. And we have a KWL workbook. What do you notice? What do you wonder? My two favorite questions as a science teacher. I have a section for read and annotate. So it's pulled out text, a place for them to take notes. It's pulled out the key vocabulary words, answer and explain, short answer questions. And even if you didn't use this daily, how many of us have ever needed a sub in a last minute lesson plan? And you were scrambling for something, trying to figure something out. This could be something that you have banked in case you ever need to generate something. Obviously, there's a lot of ways that we could improve this, but as far as a time saver, this is something that I can get to the copier or I can send to the front desk or one of my teaching partners and have them be able to generate it for me on the fly. Or say you found a quick article and you don't have time to rewrite it and change it, I can use Diffit for that, print it out, get it to my students, and then differentiate the article for different students. I can, I can have four different, I can have 12 different Lexile levels if I wanted to. Um, can you attach any material that is saved? We used uh, the reading levels higher and some of it. Yes, you can modify it. Um, right now, it's anything really that's digital print uh, you can do. You can even do your own. You can customize it. So if you wanted to go in and uh, create your own, we can copy and paste text here. And the neat thing is it also saves everything you've done. So you have a history of all of the articles and things you've done in the past. So you can always go back to them. Teachers, how are we doing so far? Let me know in the chat. We doing we doing good? You ready for the next the next tool? Awesome. So next up, that was Diffit. Uh, the next one that I want to cover is MagicSchool.ai. Um, we're just going to do a brief overview of this one. Now, what I want to do is is there. Are I a whole bunch of them. Um, these ones are free. Uh, try these first because there's a lot out there that are asking teachers to pay for things um, uh, that are, you can get for free. And these are ones that that I think I've I vetted as great places to start. MagicSchool.ai has a lot of different features and I haven't even fully explored them, but I do like what they're starting to do. One of the things that you can do is you could do similar things to Diffit, but I want to cover some of the tools. So here you have a lesson plan generator. You can create YouTube video questions, even report card comments. So unless you have kind of boilerplate comments, these are things that, that again, we're, we're thinking about time savers. You can enter in some information that allows them to be able to you know, customize it to who that student is, and then you can copy and paste those comments in there. Um, there's a rubric generator, uh, IEP generator. This is one that people on my special education team have have used, and they've they've had they they've had like varying feedback on it, but they've they said it's a good starting place. Um, teacher jokes I haven't really learned, I haven't really used too often, um, but the one that I think would be really interesting is there is a science. Oh, there's a five E lesson plan, and there's a science lab. Uh, let's see if I can find it on here. Science Lab Generator. Now, the Science Lab Generator, I tried it with the human microbiome was my favorite, but maybe we could do a, a Science Lab, maybe the first person in the chat. Give me a Science Lab topic uh, that we could we could look up and let's, let's create one on the fly and see what the Science Lab that it has. So first person in the chat uh, that tells me a topic. Ninth grade, what was law? All right. I'm going to fast type it. All right, so let's do, let's type in the chat, additional comments. I'm not even going to do everything else. We're just going to type that in there. And it generates a science lesson. Um, so this is one students will invest, investigate, let's see, to understand the relationship between electrostatic force acting between two charged objects and the distance between them. Here's my objects. Inflate balloons, tie a string, hang the balloons slightly apart, measure the distance between the balloons and record it, rub one balloon with wool fabric. Give it a negative charge, rub the balloon with wool fabric, give it a positive charge, slowly bring the balloons together to observe any movement, measure the distance at which the balloons repel or attract each other. Now, this is not a lab that I've done. Um, this is one where I would look at it and I would see like, okay, you know what? 
At worst, this might give me an idea of something I can do. At best, I can copy paste it and, and just go do it right away. Most of the things that I find are gonna fall in between those two categories with this. Um, I just wanted to show the science lab aspect of it because many of us are science teachers or we're teachers of science. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but this is one of those tools with magicschool.ai. What they're trying to be is a one-stop shop for all of your education AI needs. So explore it, check it out, see what it generates, find what's high quality, find what's low quality. Again, even if you're skeptical and you're resistant to these things, it's good to know the state of the art of AI technology and education right now so that we can accurately critique it because we need both the people who are evaluating it from a critical perspective. And we also need the bleeding edge innovators to say, how can we innovate on education? How can we improve things? How can we make education more accessible to more people? We need both of those people to, at the table having this conversation. Um, Cause in the end, our students are gonna benefit. So that's magic school um, dot AI. And again, it's gonna be in the shared resources uh, that, I, that I drop in the, in the chat. Well, the next tool is a tool called Brisk. This is a Chrome extension. And right down here in the bottom of my screen, there's a little Brisk tool. So if you're familiar with Chrome extensions, they're like little programs that you can add on to your computer. Um, and maybe it's a little bit easier to show you a visual here. Brisk can differentiate materials like Google Docs or websites. It can You can give feedback to students. You can actually inspect student writing. Now, one thing that people often ask is like, how do you check for AI? Which is a great question because you can't use AI checkers to check for AI because they're not accurate. So any AI detection tool is not gonna be accurate. Um, this is one of the reasons why OpenAI, who made ChatGPT, got rid of their AI detection software. They stopped letting people use it because it generates so many false positives. Um, but there is one way you can check kind of the legitimacy of something, or at least if it was input with integrity. And I'll show you one of the tools for that. You can also uh, give level resources for students. And so let me go ahead and demonstrate in my notes. So here are my notes that I'm gonna share with everyone. In the bottom right-hand corner, I have my Brisk tool. So what I could do with this is, oh, I'm using it on my personal account. So let me make sure that I go ahead and share this. and refresh. There we go. So here I can create a quiz. I can create exemplars, depth of knowledge questions. So I can create a quiz. Now these are my notes, so the quiz wouldn't make a ton of sense. But the neat thing about the quiz is I can change the language in the quiz. I can make it you know, different grade levels, different questions. And if I want this quiz to cover, let's say the microbiome, so I'm just gonna pick a different topic and click next. I can make it in a Google form. And what it will do is generate a quiz for me as a Google form. I'm just going ahead and clicking some permissions right now. And so right now in the background, it is creating a quiz for me based on the topic that I just gave it. Now in this one, this is a microbiome quiz. So it's pulling up and generating questions. This isn't necessarily about the specific doc, but if you use Google Forms or Google Quizzes, uh, this is one way to instantly create a quiz based on the text. And this is brisk. Um, yes, all these links will be, will be shared with you. Uh, I put everything on one Google Doc. You also can inspect the writing. So if I go to inspect writing and click replay, it will show you what I typed in real time. So these are my notes and I can fast forward it. I can speed it up. We're gonna go back. Let me go ahead and hit play. And you notice up here in the top left-hand side, it shows me the date. So October 8th, 2023. Notice the time. Do you see how I'm typing along the way? Do you know what would really concern me? Is as I'm, as I'm playing this, a huge paragraph shows up all of a sudden. Now, if that happened, 
teachers, what would that cue you that happened if you saw a huge chunk of text show up as you're playing everything back in real time? Yeah, if you were gonna type in that they copied and pasted, that's what it would be. Now here you can see that I typed in everything kind of like in real time. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, Carl got it. Yeah, they they copied and pasted it. And this is what it's doing is it's playing back the revision history in Google Docs. And you can speed that up. And so you can see that it was typed faithfully. Is it perfect? Um, no. Could a student open chat GPT in another window or another essay in another window and hand type it? Yes, of course. There's ways around things. But is it one additional tool that you can use to kind of check the integrity of something? Yeah, it is. So this is a useful tool that's in Brisk. Um, as well as the ability to give feedback. So you can generate feedback in Brisk and it will, once you've generated feedback for a student five times, if it notices that you're saying the same thing, it'll start auto-generating that feedback for you. So you can just click on that person and it will give them instant feedback for say comma splice or missing evidence. It'll learn specific student uh, typing patterns. All right. Now this one is, uh, again, this would be on my teacher account, um, but students wouldn't have access to it unless a school pushed it out. Um, this would be like more of a teacher tool when you're doing um, assessments or you're evaluating a student um, or you're giving them feedback or you want to generate some type of formative assessment or a quiz or something like that. Now they also have YouTube integration. So if I went into YouTube, uh, which would not be spelled you, YouTube, and I wanted to do CNN Student News here. Um, once this loads, see if we can skip the advertisement. All right, there we go. Bottom right-hand corner. Once the YouTube video is loaded, let's go ahead and pause this. I'm going to click on Brisk, click Create, and I'm going to create a quiz um, in English. Now you can see right here, it's saying use YouTube video, which is what I want. So we're going to make this for seventh graders and I can select certain standards. I want these to be multiple choice. I don't want five questions just to make sure they watched it, but I can do long response or short response. And I'm going to hit next. And I want to put this in a Google doc this time. So I'm going to click brisket. Um, and I realized I just said brisket, which sounds like barbecue. Now I'm hungry. Anyways, these are questions that are generated based on that video. So what it did is it took the transcript of the video and then it created questions based on it. So this is kind of just a simple way for you to have students watch the video and then be able to see, did they understand and, and learn the information that you wanted them to learn? Um, so again, another time saver. All right, so next, as we kind of like wind down on our time, uh, I want to introduce a fun tool. So I showed you some of the AI videos that exist uh, with Will Smith and the, the woman walking through the rain and the dog typing on the computer. This is one that has to do with music. And I don't want to overstate it, but it's getting scary good as far as music generation. So there's a website or a company called Suno, and they do text to music. So what we're going to do is click make a song and we're teachers. So we're going to click create and in the chat, can you give me a topic in a genre of music? I made a song about lasers made to West coast nineties, hip hop rap. I want like a new, just earlier today, we did one on hedgehogs and reggae, but I need a, I need a topic. So I need like a subject and then I need a genre of music where this is going to be kind of silly, but I also want you to think about how this could, endocrine system in 2000s pop. Okay. Uh, we're just going to roll with it. Um, so we're going to do endocrine system in 2000s. Uh, so song about endocrine system, song about the endocrine system made with a 2000s pop vibe. You really, uh, reproductive system in the Beach Boys, rap and animal classifications. <laughs> you all are my people. All right, let's click create. And I have no idea how this is going to go, but based on history, it's been pretty good. So what it's doing right now is creating a song 
Um, and I've done this with students and they had a great time um, doing it. It's, it's one of those free services where you get like 50 credits and every song is like, I don't know, four to 10 credits. Um, that's enough. Okay. We have, I don't know, chemical harmony and chemical reaction. So I'm, I'm curious about those. On the right-hand side, it's going to show us the lyrics. So I'm going to play it. I think I'm still sharing the, uh, the audio. Let me double check. So, oh no, there we go. Share sound. And here we go. Oh, here we go. Working in harmony from my thyroid to my pancreas, they are a part of me. Adrenaline rushing, hormones go wild in this chemical symphony. I'm feeling so alive. All right, some of you like that, right? Like, some of you were feeling that song, like you're ready for my mixtape to come out this summer. Um, that wasn't bad. So, what you have to do. Like even if you didn't do anything else on all the learning stuff that I showed you today, you have to go in this and generate some songs. You're even better. Have your students do it. Have them create songs to their favorite genre of music about the learning. The lyrics, many of the lyrics are like, they're accurate. And have them evaluate the accuracy of the lyrics. See if, they, if there's a mistake in there. How would you change it? How would you remix it? I mean, this is a great hook with students combining music with your content. And it makes it accessible for everyone because you can do so many different genres of music. And it's even better when it doesn't do a good job. They can go, oh, it didn't learn, um, what's Desiree Whitmore, uh, Gamelan, Gamelan, Gamelan. It's a music with like hitting dishes and bells and brass things. Um, but it didn't do a good job when we did that. But when I did lasers to West Coast hip hop rap, um, Let's do, let's see, uh, there was reproductive, I'm scared to do reproductive system uh, in there. At least with my students, I would be scared to do it. I wanna do this, solar system. Ryan's probably like, Eric, are you gonna talk about like science teacher right now? Talk about the solar system set to 90s West Coast rap beats. Remember, I'm from Southern California, so I'm a little bit biased in this. <laughs> Taylor Swift. Ah, yeah. Taylor Swift. Uh, oh, right. Okay, good. You're digging it. Um, all right. We got Cosmic Odyssey. All right. So let's do this one, and then we're going to get into some questions. So let's see how Cosmic Odyssey does. Yeah, check it. I'm about to take you on a cosmic ride through the solar system where the stars collide. Let's blast off. Feel the bass hit hard. All right, I'm gonna pause there. <laughs> I have way too much fun doing this. Um, we're gonna we're gonna pause there, and I'm I, I'm gonna drop in uh, Ryan. If you have access to it, we could drop in the the resources in the chat. Um, those were those were some of the the big ones. Uh, if you do want to go further, um, there are a couple things that I wanted to share that I think would be really really valuable, and they're in, they're in the chat. So the first one, um, why don't I just go ahead and share this this uh, this document? So let's go ahead and put this up there. Um, the first one is ISTE, which is you know global worldwide ed, ed tech organization. Uh, they have an AI kind of a hub with great resources on there. So if you want to dive deeper into this, um, they have a lot of free resources. And the one I really wanted to point out is this elementary educator AI guide. They have some PBL, project-based learning or problem-based learning around AI. Also for secondary educators, elective educators, computer science, um, 
and it's it's free. You can click on it and it's it's good. It's good information. Um, it's it's a great tool. In addition to that, they have a ton of additional tools down here at the bottom um, that you can use. So I've kind of saved you the headache of Googling and trying to like go to all these different websites. I'm gonna just give you two. Here's one, lots of good information on it as an educator. There's a lot of noise out there, but these are this is a great one. The second one is code.org. If you're looking for ways to kind of differentiate or you want some extension activities for students and you want to give them some relevant skills, they can go on code.org and there's curriculum where they can learn how to code using AI, which is kind of the frontier right now. And so they can go through this. It's, it's guided for them. This could be something that they do if they finish all their work early, or if you have an elective class and you want to include this in there, this can be one too. There's so many different resources. My students have been using it. And they get really excited about it. Um, and it's good. And it's from code.org, which is a phenomenal organization. Um, I want to pause there because there are some questions. And uh, I know folks got to leave because it's it's the end of the day. But um, Ryan, maybe you can let me know if there's questions in the chat. Or uh, teachers, if you want to chime in. Can the slide deck be sent out as well? Sean, what I'll do is I'll take my slide deck and I'll add it to the, do you have the link to all the resources that um, we dropped in there. If not, I can drop uh, it in again this way. Okay, week. Ryan will drop it in there. And Sean, what I'll do is when this webinar ends, I'll put in my slide deck link in that do Google document and then you all can use it. And please feel free to like remix all this stuff. You don't need to credit me for these things. I'm just a beggar showing another beggar where to find food. So tell everybody you made it up, put together a PD and share all this with everyone. And like you be the guru in your site for this stuff. Like if, if I create anything useful for you, take it. Go be the rock star. Go help your kids. Um, it was awesome. Uh, all right, Ryan, what do we got? Yeah, so um, most of the questions were actually about Brisk. Um, people wanted to know if you were using Brisk um, to look at student stocks. Uh, does the student also have to have Brisk installed or do you have to be the owner of the original doc? Yeah, so the, you do have to be the owner. So they do have to share it with you. So you want it, you would want it in a in like a learning management system that automatically shares. Um, if they give you view only access, you're not going to be able to to do that read back feature. So uh, that's that's a great question. I learned that kind of the hard way. Um, in the chat, I just dropped brisk uh, privacy policy. Uh, it's going to vary depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, but they go in there and they talk about uh, FERPA and COPA. Uh, so you can see their compliance um, with those things, what data they log, what data they don't log. Um, so go ahead and check that out and see if that falls in line with your school's policy. I know many schools have a ed, ed tech specialist department and they sometimes have to approve and not approve certain tools. So that's, that's where they would go. Um, Renee, thank you, I'm glad. Um, and then people also wanted to know, um, is Brisk free? Is, is, it, is it Dip It? Is that the other one? Is so that both free as well? Both of them are freemium services. I think uh, Diffit is free all the way through March, like like mid-March or something like that. So what I did, I took all my Amplify articles and I, cause I know what the articles are. And then I just made resources using Diffit. It took me like an hour or two, but once I was done, I had all the resources I need. I, I had three or four different versions of every article for my lessons. And I just put those in Google Drive and, and now I have them all. Um, so, I'm not encouraging people to try to be cheap, but we're teachers. And, you know, if you ain't got the money for it, we got to find some way to, to get what our kids need. And so, you know, use that freemium account. They give you 60 days for a reason. And so make the most of it. And if your district's willing to pay for it, um, all the better. But I know not everybody has those access to those resources. Yeah, those were pretty much all of our questions um, that people had. I have to say, Suno is very cool. I would have <laughs> loved to have that. Well, I would have loved to have it when I was in school because it would be pretty cool to almost use it as a studying tool because I think it's easy to remember song lyrics sometimes. Yeah. So if you knew the information was accurate, it would be kind of a good way to study almost. It is. You know, it's there's it's so many, so many neat things. Douglas, I just want to pause real quick and just give a shout out to Douglas. He's an older teacher, but you know, willing to dip his, his foot in the AI waters. Like, that's so great. We need, we need educators because we are. We're teachers of teaching and learning. Like we are, that is our profession. And so as this new technology comes towards us, we need everybody at the table 
to be sharing their perspective on things because just because it's bright, shiny, and new doesn't mean it's always best for kids in all circumstances. So we we all need to be there having these conversations. So Douglas, shout out to you for, for doing that, um, you know, trying things out. I use music in my classroom. Yeah. Yeah, I good. saw one other question about um, when uh, the recording will be available because people want to watch this live. I do just want to let everybody know the recording should come um, in the next day or two. Uh, so you should have access to that. Just keep an eye out in your email um, from for an email from us. Okay. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and share just a couple more free resources. Um, if you want free resources, activities, posters, uh, lessons, a whole bunch of just free, awesome stuff, head over to our STEM free resource library. Uh, this is kind of a, a new thing that we've been pushing out where we've taken our most popular uh, items uh, that people love, like uh, talk and read and write like scientists posters and put them all in one easy, accessible place for you to download and get access to those for free. So if you want access to those, head over to amplify.com slash STEM free resources. If you want to learn more about Amplify Science, head over to amplify.com slash science. And if you're a current Amplify Science user, feel free to join our Facebook community. We always have a ton of great things going on in there from people sharing um, things that they've had great success with in their classroom, asking questions, getting advice. Uh, so it's a great resource to access for those of you um, who are Amplify Science users. Uh, to get access to that group, head over to facebook.com slash groups slash Amplify Science Community. Um, and with that, I just wanted to thank everybody so much for coming. Eric, you were incredible as always. So um, yeah, thank you. Teachers, thank you. And in the chat or in the document now is the slide deck. So I added that to the document. So if you refresh it or check it, you can click and see all the slides. I will drop that document in the chat one more time. Thanks, Ryan. Teachers, have a great evening. Go take care of yourself. And uh, hopefully I'll see you sometime soon. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone.